الله نحمد سبحانه حمدا كثيرا ونصلي ونسلم على عبده ورسوله محمد بن عبد الله صلاة وسلاما دائمين متلازمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We've been tackling two issues together. One is the issue of the Muslim Ummah's unity and the need for that. Under death, there is a theme of what we need to do as a community, and that is to raise a great Muslim generation of leaders. This is very vital, and this is the role that we are tasked with. Wherever Allah puts you, whether it is Moscow or Washington, whether it is Sana or Cairo, Riyadh or Ribat, wherever you are as a Muslim, you need to discover what mission do you have that is relevant to your location. So the Muslim's duty in a place like Mecca is not exactly the same like somebody who lives outside the whole Muslim parameters of where Islam is the popular religion. We live in a society that needs Islam as sick bodies ask for medication and scream for help. We live in a society where the ailments of the society are calling for our immediate intervention not even to wait, but we don't have time to waste waiting for another generation 40 years down the line to bring about a better generation. We have to work for it, but we have to start working to help our society deal with its ailments. Alcoholism is an ailment. Violence is an ailment. Random killing is an ailment. Drugs is a huge ailment. Sex before marriage is an ailment. Ultimate, absolute, unconditional freedoms is an ailment. Broken family is an ailment. Who is going to work on those ailments? If not us, with joined hands of other faith communities, then who is going to do it? Who is going to be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls on the tongue of the prophets, saying, Alaysa minkum rajulun rashid? Who is going to call this ummah, the American ummah, and tell them, Don't you have wise heads? Don't you have people who care? And the reality is, there are lots of people who care, including in particular, young American men and women. They know what is ailing their society, but they are living by what they inherit. And what they inherit doesn't seem to be good. Likewise, our own children, who are supposed to be following the Muslim path, if they live by what they inherit from their parents, that is not good either. It is not good. So we have to define our mission. I suggest that the mission of Muslims in a non-Muslim land starts with first to be Muslims. To be Muslims means that you and your children comply with what Allah expects of you. You and your children, not only you, you and your children. Many of our Muslim families, unfortunately, the parents are doing much better than the children. This discrepancy is a recipe for disastrous following generation. Why? Because it sets a barrier between what you do versus what they think they need to do. They absorb from the environment things that we do not because they are living in a massive enculturating society, which means all societies would like their culture 
to prevail in every generation. Whatever this culture, good or bad, every society wants young children to inherit what they think is good for them. So we need to be vigilant when it comes to our children. Otherwise, if they inherit the normalization of sin and vice, then they are looking at the wrong side of the society. The society has the good, the bad, and the ugly. All societies do. Why our children, in particular, and other minority children, why are they looking to be followers? Because the society places a high price on conformity. Conformity means that a person is not allowed to deviate from the group norm. This is what your children will tell you, peer pressure. Peer pressure means the customs acceptable and the norms by which their group work is not consistent with their faith. And if they do not follow the customs of the group, they will be ostracized, alienated, left out, and cast out. So their choice, the normal choice for most of the children is to conform and follow what the group expects of them, which is the wrong choice. Because as a human being, as a good, conscientious human being, you should always take anything presented to you with a grain of salt. Unless it comes from the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That, we take it to learn it, we learn it to practice it, we practice it to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a concept that we need to focus on. We as adult Muslims and our children as young Muslims need to learn this process. Our faith should not be limited to an idea in our head or a sword that we hang to our side or a gun to shoot at people. That's not the Islamic faith. Islamic faith means a belief system that influences how you think, how you behave, on what basis you make choices. Those elements of our faith are not exactly clear for most of us and definitely not for our children. And this is where a conversation needs to take place. We need to talk with our children. We need to start talking with our children. We need to sit down, listen to them, and see what their concerns are, what their challenges are, and offer them what Islam tells you to offer them. Don't offer them your ideas. We are not intelligent enough as creatures to devise our own life chart. That's why Allah sent prophets and sent down messages. Because He knows. So when it comes to comparing our knowledge collectively as creatures with the knowledge of Allah, it's nothing. When we add up all of our collective wisdom, you don't even compare it with Allah's wisdom. And Allah does not command us to do anything except out of divine knowledge and divine wisdom. Divine knowledge and divine wisdom. But those are only acceptable to people who believe in Allah. So the first step that we need to work on is to check in our heart. Do we have enough faith in our heart that we can export or transfer or inculcate in our children? Because faith, by and large, starts as inherited belief system. Children at young age, normally they follow their parents. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, every newborn is born with an innate nature to believe and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَبَوَى Then his parents turn him into a Jew, a Christian, or a Majus, fire worshipper, or worshipper of anything. 
the essence of the hadith is parents do plant faith in their children the faith they adapt that they let pass on to their children so we need to be careful because we are not the only parents for our children i will repeat this we are not the only parents for our children as a source of guidance we have a lot of competition so you're not the only source of guidance your children engage with and interact with their environment their environment keeps feeding them with ideas belief systems principles values that may or may not be consistent with what you believe out of your own faith so you are not the only parent having established that understanding then you need to recognize your competition and how they compete and how they influence your children whether it is sourced in the media direct or indirect media social media in particular which our kids are engaged with most and more than all else and you need to look at their friends and their school and their teachers and the clubs they join whatever they join of clubs those become also a source of ideas and belief systems so we need to be engaged in their life as much as they are engaged in their social political and educational environment their sources may not be yours you may not be fully aware of what they are exposed to once they hit the button on their computer and go on the internet you don't know what their search is what they are interested in and you don't want to wait until you discover it when they turn teenage uh, level and beyond because then it is late so you have to accompany your children in their journey in their pursuit of knowledge in their pursuit of information if information is power information also can demoralize when they go on the internet and they always read and hear news and articles and even government personnel pr pronouncements that islam is always tied with terrorism it becomes demoralizing so they look at you as their source not of safety but their source of potential trouble so the media that they are engaged with can result in them fighting against what you believe in why because it exposes them to danger so we have to be careful as parents what is our mission and our role with our children in this society how much do we want to spend of time and investment to bring our children closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what institutions have we set up to make our children feel proud to be muslims or at least to feel safe being muslim when your daughter's hijab is pulled off in the school don't take it lightly and don't take it as a sign of an attack and you become afraid take it as a challenge that tells you you must get out of your comfort zone and go to the school and keep talking until this issue never happens again not only to your daughter but to all muslim girls in the school that's how we get engaged in the society that's how we make our voices heard so that our culture becomes part of the american culture and by the way the vast majority of schools will support you 200% but when you give up and let your children become prey to rogue children of their friends and schoolmates you deliver them to become victims and to become afraid to continue to be muslims let not your girls cry because they are muslims it is haram for you to make islam their source of grief because they live in a different society because they are made to feel less because they are a minority they are not a minority 
if they have all of us to back them up in every incident where our children or a child is discriminated against it is up to us to give it the attention it needs and to push back against those rogue children Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ if it were not for Allah pushing people against each other, corruption would have spread on earth. And it did. It did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what some corrupt people want to do. وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا Those who are following their whims and desires, they want you to bend and tilt all the way, even more than them. Why? Because as righteousness needs company, wickedness also needs company. So those wicked ones, they want our children to follow their path. So what is alarming for us? Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with faith as a belief system. What is alarming for us is when my daughter or my son start to pick a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that becomes alarming. Because we consider that zina is worse than shirk. Allah tells us shirk is the worst thing, we don't care. Zina still is. Why? Because it is a crime that also comes with the shame and the dishonor to the person and to their family. So dishonoring the family is more serious in our eyes than dishonoring Allah. This is where we need to fix how we think. So if your child is learning philosophy that takes him or her away from the faith itself, then that's a, you know, a minor matter. He needs just, just some discussion and we don't take it seriously. But when they start talking to you or showing you signs that I picked a girlfriend, this is the end of life. Because it has to do with how we feel. So long as we do not value what Allah values in the same way, our measures and our uh, balance and scale will always be skewed away from where it should be. It will always be shifted and tilted away from where it should be. Our balance should start with what is important for Allah. How do we know what is important for Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah would never forgive someone who dies on shirk. But a life mushrik can always repent. After all, many of the companions of the Prophet, they used to worship idols. But once they understood what faith is about, why they should not worship idols, and they accepted Islam, they submitted and they became leaders of the greatest ummah Allah has ever raised for mankind, which means to serve mankind. So shirk is the most serious sin to live by and potentially to die on shirk. For us, we are ranking zina and fahisha as more serious than shirk. We need to shift this because the opposite of shirk is tawheed. Once there is tawheed in the hearts of your children, they would know what their reference for life guidance is. It becomes Allah. It becomes the word of Allah, the book of Allah, the messenger of Allah. It becomes revolving around Allah and what pleases Allah. This is important. Then their own measure becomes your measure. But if you keep tracking their individual violations of minor fractions or even major fractions, then you will keep tracking them for life. You cannot do that. We all know physically that if you have a poor person, 
don't just give him a fish for now, but teach him how to fish. We all understand what this is. Empower the poor so that they can fend for themselves. When it comes to knowledge and guidance, our children are neither left to fend for themselves in the right way, nor are they given the knowledge you have mustered for your life so that they have it ready. They are not given a fish and they are not being led to fish in the right pond. The pond in which they live is not fit for fishing. It is not. So please, you have to answer this serious question. When do you raise your children? Physically, they grow. Give them food or don't give them food. They will fend for themselves because if you're hungry, you try to get food any way you can. So they will fend for themselves physically. And they will be provided. Allah promised. Everybody is provided. Allah, you know, circled it both ways. We provide for you and for them. In another ayah, we provide for them and for you. So don't fear for the risk. It is not the most important thing, the profession your child picks. What is most important and more important is what faith do they pick? What source of guidance they follow? Do they believe in Allah? Do they love Allah? Those are the important issues. That's what makes their head think in a certain way or another. So we have to be careful that we do not miss an opportunity to teach our children and to show them the way. The way forward for Muslims in this country is number one, to designate time for our children. There is an internet story and from time to time I get things forwarded to my account. That a child asked his dad, he said, Dad, how much do you make for an hour of work? He said, $20. And the child has collected those $20. And he said, Baba, may I give you $20 to spend an hour with you? Just an hour. The story is telling how much hungry and thirsty our children for face-to-face Sit down and rationalize and teach your children where their interest is. Our children need to understand what the Prophet ﷺ told us. They are told by the culture to go after what is pleasant and fun. That is their criteria. If it is fun, go ahead and do it. If you enjoy it, go ahead and do it. That's what the culture is telling them, to live by their own taste. The Prophet ﷺ tells us to live by what is beneficial to us. احرص على ما ينفعك. This principle, to live according to what benefits you and to go after what benefits you, as the Prophet ﷺ says, is lost on us adults. We adults are living by our taste, unfortunately. And we have become consumers of whatever anybody else produces. Ideas, cultures, art, you name it, we consume it. And that makes us a dependent nation, not an independent nation. Allah wants us to be free. We're telling him we don't want to be free. We want to follow these guys. We want to import. We want to dress the way they dress. We want to cut our hair the way they cut their hair. What makes them laugh makes us laugh. What makes them sad makes us sad. So we become as dependent as a child, a baby child that cannot do anything for themselves. And this is how we became helpless collectively as a nation. We cannot benefit even this society 
unless we become free, like everybody else. People in this society, including you and I, are free to choose, to choose what to believe, how to practice their faith, how to raise their children, how to manage their community, how to control their community resources, how to direct their children, how to contribute to society. Everybody is free to do all of that. Why do we not exercise this freedom? Because we inherited implicit system of slavery. Most of us, like myself, who grew up in the East, we inherited a system of slavery. We are enslaved primarily to our desires. Because most of our desires are not met when we are children, when we are youth, when we grow up as adults. Most of our desires are channeled by the system of government under which you live and in whose existence you have no saying whatsoever. So we grow up in societies that deprive everybody from their basic freedom. I remember in a discussion, Dr. Jamal Badawi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his soul, he is a da'iyah that is known worldwide in Canada. He was in a discussion with a group of non-Muslims, and they asked him, they said, uh, he presented Islam and so on, and then they asked him, what about women freedom? There is no freedom for women. Women cannot choose. Women cannot speak. Women cannot travel this. Women this, women this. And his answer amazed me. He said, you're talking about women in the East, in the Eastern cultural society, mostly the Muslim society. I want to tell you something that you already know. In our society, neither women nor men have a voice in what's done in their society. It's not about women. It's not about femininity or masculinity. It is about the system under which we live. We need not to pass on this submissive, misdirected life to our children. A culture of isolation, insulation, living in our four walls, whether you call them the home or the mosque or whatever institution we work with, and then as if we don't live in this society. Isolation is wrong. The only way to make life better for a next generation is to change the life you already have, where you are as is. Help the society get rid of some of the diseases. It is not enough to say, but my son, he doesn't take drugs. That much I know. Or my daughter doesn't smoke, alhamdulillah. Because she doesn't smoke today. What about tomorrow? He doesn't drink today. What about tomorrow? What would prevent them? What inoculation or immunization have you give them, have you given them to protect them from making those wrong choices? What about their environment? So we need to focus on our children as we are the primary, if not the only source that shows them the way to Allah and the path to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to do what is right. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to use examples but before I continue I want to ask you to please fill in the gaps next to you and ahead of you please we have brothers who are standing by please move right or left or forward Whatever spot you have, fill it, please. Come forward. Thank you. 
the Prophet ﷺ used to throw examples at his companions. So, to give an example for prayer, the Prophet ﷺ asked the companions, what do you think of a person who has a running river in front of his house? If he takes a shower in that river five times a day, would this leave any dirt on him? They said, no. Then he said, this is exactly how prayer works. If you pray five times a way, your sins will be removed as the dirt is removed in the five day time showers. So we need to, we need to empower our children, give them examples, give them ideas how to deal with their issues, how to deal with the challenges, how to deal with peer pressure, how to have and apply their own righteous pressure on others rather than wait for a negative pressure to come on them and then cry. Empower them to push back. Empower them to be the lighting torch in the darkness of their environment. To help other kids get away from drugs, get away from premarital sex, get away from violence and gangs. This is how you help them influence their environment. We have seen children coming all the way from Florida to Washington after this school shooting to say enough is enough. But haven't we seen this movie before? Haven't we heard of Jonesboro, Arkansas or Boulder, Colorado or other schools from California to Florida to Chicago, many other places? So we have seen this movie coming again and again and again. Children are standing up and adults are waffling. It's amazing. So our children should pick this opportunity to be part of the reform in the society. Their peers, one of their peers would be the next member of Congress, the next senator, the next leader in their community, the next mayor. And why our children are not part of the society? Because we are insular, we are isolating them, and we are not showing them the way to engage with positive influence rather than engage and become victims of the negative influence. So you can be engaged on both ways. You can be engaged with a gang or with the righteous group in your school and push against the gang, push against violence. This is a cause that, that should be very dear to our hearts. We Muslims continue to say Islam is peace. Let it offer this peace to the society and the environment in which we live. This is part of the mission of living in a society that is plagued with several social ailments that we just cited some of them. So my brothers, my sisters, answer this question between you and Allah. Am I giving my children the time that is long enough and good enough, quality time of information, education, empowerment, maturation, and engagement. This is the question we adults need to ask. Short of giving them time, whatever else you give them is really meaningless. Food, they can get it with or without you. Clothing, they will get it with or without you. But guidance, you are their primary, if not the only source of guidance in their life. Most of us do not have extended families. But even if you do, your extended family relatives cannot substitute for your role as a father and as a mother. And here I have to say that our overall level of attention that we give to our children and to our wives in particular is not really up to par. It is not. So these are not only our children 
that are deprived of our input in their life, but also our wives are crying to get us engaged in raising the children in particular, especially when they turn into close to teenage. Who will teach them about sexual responsibility? Who will teach them about social responsibility? Who will teach them about their responsibility as individuals between them and Allah? Who will teach them about their individual responsibility regarding the knowledge they have vis-a-vis -vis the knowledge they are missing? Who is going to guide them as to what sources to look for even on the internet to get the correct information and not to be drowned by false information about Islam or about Muslims? So as you see, our responsibility is huge. And our role is equally huge. So before we get deep talking about raising a great Muslim generation, we need to have great Muslim parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to be great Muslim parents. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa aafina fi man aafayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma aqsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik. ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ذأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة